that again, or some of it. <laughs> so I was just telling a story before the live streaming about how both Ajahn Brahmali and myself came in contact with Ajahn Brahm as our teacher. A little bit, actually quite similar ways, but then very different trajectories, both with incredible learning opportunities. And today's little reflection this evening is about the Buddha and uh, how the Buddha is really our first teacher if we consider ourselves Buddhists and if we're you know, drawn to the Dhamma and inspired by the Dhamma, if we're practicing the Dhamma, then the Buddha is actually the source of all of this. And I just wanted to bring this up as um, one of the reflections to help us increase our sad indriya, our faith, our confidence um, as a quality in our hearts that, like Ajahn Brahmali said, can go hand in hand with wisdom and does go hand in hand with wisdom, but also is the proximate cause for joy to arise in the sequence of dependent liberation. Yeah. And I think I said in the first talk that I gave on Sadda that the cause for confidence to arise, the proximate cause in some of these sequences we find is actually suffering, which is very interesting and rather... Um, rather wonderful, actually, I feel, because if suffering can give rise to something so wonderful as confidence, deep, enduring confidence in the Dhamma, in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, what an amazing thing that is. It's really, truly a light at the end of the tunnel, isn't it? And so I wanted to read just a little bit of that, uh, that sequence here. And this is from the simile of the cloth, Vatupaman uh, Sutta, number seven in the Majjhima Nikaya. And here it's talking about what happens to us when we release, give up, abandon, relinquish some of the imperfections in our mind. So when the hindrances are weakened a little bit. And in this particular example, it's talking about somebody who's already a stream winner. So they actually have weakened their hindrances a lot. Um, Actually, I mean, they haven't really uprooted craving and aversion yet, but at least they've penetrated to right view. So in my experience, people who have attained that stage on the path, they may still show some signs of anger or greed from time to time, but they really don't seem to have very much behind them. They kind of expire very quickly, very fast, because there's no sense of self that's fueling them. So this is relevant to all of us, not only to the stream winners. And it's beautiful because it talks about this sequence. So it says, when one has given up, expelled, released, abandoned and relinquished the imperfections of the mind in part, they consider thus, I'm possessed of unwavering confidence in the Buddha and they gain inspiration in the meaning, inspiration in the Dhamma. So that's Atta Veda and Dhamma Veda, inspiration. They gain, gain gladness connected with the Dhamma, Pamoja. When one is glad, rapture is born, that's piti. In one who has piti or one who is rapturous, the body becomes tranquil, Pasadi. In one whose body is tranquil, they feel pleasure, that's sukha, happiness, contentment, pleasure. In one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes stilled. Here, that's translated as concentrated, but that basically is the word samadhi. So it means one is able to enter the deep jhanas. And so today I wanted to um, draw out this, in, this um, qualities of the Buddha as refuge, as one of the three refuges that we can um, use to gladden our mind, to uplift our mind, and also to give us um, direction and guidance on this path, because the Buddha is the one who discovered the Dhamma. He discovered, like they say in the suttas, this um, lost city in the jungle to which the path was all overgrown. You know, It wasn't possible to find the way to this place and people forgot all about it. And then the Buddha came along and rediscovered this ancient path that led to this beautiful forgotten city that had parks and lovely meadows and ponds. And so he rediscovered this. It was something that was always there. The Dhamma is something that is always there, but it, it can get lost when we don't have a Buddha in this world. And especially a Sama Sam Buddha, somebody who is actually capable of um, rediscovering this path. Yeah. 
you're discovering it at a time when there aren't any teachers around to teach him. He just has such immense, or her, right? Who knows, maybe a future Buddha could be female or gender non-binary. Is that controversial? <laughs> Who knows? But, uh, you know, to actually rediscover something that has been lost without a teacher, it's almost unimaginable for us, isn't it? Imagine the depth of wisdom and the qualities that he'd been developing for so many lives. And not only does recollection of any of these refuges give us a lot of joy and inspiration, but it also offers comfort and support, you know, especially if we can uh, really start to gain inspiration from the suttas and, and you know, learn to use them as a reliable source of guidance, which they are. And hopefully these teachings from Ajahn Brahmali in particular are starting to draw out some of the meanings there, starting to kind of clarify how these things um, go together you know, how some of the um, doctrines overlap and complement each other. They're not just kind of separate things that you, you know, that don't have a, um, a framework, but the whole thing starts to make sense as a whole, which is a very beautiful place to be in uh, your relationship, let's say, with the Buddha. And so the Buddha was a historical figure. He was a human being, you know, like ours, which I think makes it very powerful. And yet we're not taking refuges in him as a human, we're taking refuges in the qualities that he represents. And of course, the first of those is his enlightenment. We're taking refuge in his enlightenment in the sense that we too can develop that enlightenment within ourselves. We too can wake up, right? And what do we wake up to? We wake up to the Four Noble Truths, yeah? We wake up out of delusion and into panya, into vidya, wisdom. Mm -hmm. So this is really incredible and we take refuge in our own enlightenment in that sense. So we have to make these refuges into real internalized places within ourselves, you know, real qualities that we can tap into and take inspiration from. And uh, there's a little article that I like uh, very much by Bhikkhu Bodhi. You can probably Google it and find it online. I think it's under uh, uh, Access to Insight website. And in there, he says that um, these refuges become most powerful when they're based on right view. So again, tying in this sadha with wisdom. And I was thinking about what this really means, you know, if you look at right view in terms of, say, anicca, dukkha, anatta. Yeah. Why are these things refuges? What are they refuges from? And the first thing is, of course, anicca. We recognize that there's no security in the conditioned realm. There's no security in this world. And itcha doesn't only mean impermanence, it also means that things are unreliable, unstable, insecure. You know, we can't rely on anything. There's a lovely phrase in the suttas, it says, um, the whole world is swept away, it's swept away, like in a flood. And then there's another place that talks about um, aging and death. And the Buddha said, it's as though there were mountains coming in at you from every side, pressing in, pressing in on every side. You know, you can't escape. So, you know, we have to let go of these things. And then dukkha, you know, just very briefly, because Ajahn Brahmali has talked about this at length, but dukkha basically means that the world of these five senses cannot provide a reliable source of happiness, an enduring source of happiness. You know, it's inevitable that we're going to be separated from those we love. You know, maybe we have very good relationships, a very enriching relationship in our life or good friendships, but eventually we have to be separated, you know, at death, if not before. And nothing can prevent that, you know, nothing can prevent aging, sickness, death, loss. These are just part and parcel of our life. And so we can't really take refuge in those things. We can't really seek security from bondage in those things that are also subject to bondage. We can't really seek you know, um, stability, lasting happiness in things that are subject to cessation, subject to change. So we're looking in the wrong place when we do that. And of course, things are anatta, things are non-self. And this basically means that things are out of our control. You know, even our own body and mind, especially perhaps our own body and mind, we try to control even other people in our lives when we can't control ourselves. <laughs> How on earth can we kind of um, try to measure or control or try to preempt or make assumptions about anybody else when our own thoughts, feelings, perceptions, 
you know, our own will, our own volition is changing all the time. So, and that means we can't take these things with us because they don't belong to us. We don't possess them. We don't own them. Right? We can't take them. But as somebody said earlier today, what we can take is the goodness that we develop in our heart. And of course, you know, we can use um, the reflections on the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha to inspire those same qualities within ourselves. You know, we can take the Buddha and we can look at his qualities. He was known as Maha Karuniko, Maha Panyo. That means the great compassionate one, the one of great wisdom. Also, sometimes he was called the great physician because he was like the doctor who diagnosed the disease. This is why you suffer. This is the cause of your suffering. And here's the medicine, you know, here's the hateful path, this beautiful path that was lost, covered in jungle for so very long. And now he's discovered this and wants to offer this medicine to all of us. Isn't this so wonderful? And that he spent 45 years of his life just serving selflessly, tirelessly, you know, just lying down on one side for maybe three or four hours a night. And then again, waking, doing some walking meditation and then surveying the whole world. It says he surveyed the whole world with his divine eye to see if there were suffering beings in need of his support. And he would actually go out if he could on foot, you know, with his arms bowl and his robes, just like me, probably with less, uh, you know, good quality cloth, <laughs> probably no, no beanie either, even if it was cold. <laughs> so, and he'd just go out barefoot on the road and, and look for these people. And if he couldn't find them that way, then he would uh, use his divine eye and his psychic powers to teach them from afar. He did that with his own uh, disciple, Mahamogalana, Venerable Mahamogalana. And they could do this together because he also was a master in psychic powers. <laughs> And then there was, of course, this beautiful story of um, the way the Buddha once found out about Angulimala. You've probably all heard Angulimala's story about the um, person who was basically asked by his teacher to perform an act of faith in his teacher, or at least this is how Angulimala took it, to go out and kill a hundred living human beings. And Angulimala, had so much faith, but without wisdom, <laughs> this is the danger of faith without wisdom, right? That he just went ahead and tried to fulfill his teacher's request. That you can definitely say is a rogue teacher. So we won't be looking at teachers in terms of, you know, won't even be calling people like this teachers. You know, the Buddha also said that we should always survey our teachers for a long period of time, including him, and make sure that they are virtuous, make sure that they are you know, they don't react with greed and aversion and hatred towards anyone, but that they live a beautiful, virtuous life. That they've purified their heart, that their heart is full of compassion and wisdom. And you watch them for a long time, over many, many years, before you decide whether or not to take someone as your teacher. But in the case of Angulimala, he obviously was um, very deluded at that time, and he actually uh, managed to kill 99 living beings, which is... Uh, you know, always these interesting numbers in the Pali text. So whether we can take that literally or whether it's, you know, just a story that gives us a sort of sense of the, um, of the situation, who knows? But the Buddha basically wanted to save him. And so he went out to find him, you know, on foot. And he came across Angulimala and knew that he would probably have to um, do quite a bit to gain his confidence, right? Because he was just about to to kill him he was going to be the hundredth person and so the buddha started walking and angulimala was running behind him and he was shouting hey recluse stop 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 and the buddha carried on walking and it looked as though the buddha was walking at a normal pace but in fact angulimala couldn't catch him up and he was like what's happening here you know as soon as i walk this recluse is so many steps ahead i can't catch him so the Buddha was using these psychic powers to kind of outwit Angulimala and shouting after him, stop, stop. And then at one point the Buddha um, turned around and said to Angulimala, I've stopped already, you stop. <laughs> Isn't this fantastic? I've stopped already, you stop. And I was thinking, what does that mean? I've stopped, you know. You could see it in so many ways. I've stopped killing. I've stopped living an unvirtuous life. 
But you could also see it as I've stopped the process of dependent origination at a deeper level. We were talking about that this morning and how the process of dependent origination basically can be um, can be stopped, can be abated, first of all, slowed down, if you like, can be weakened. But ultimately, we have to stop the whole thing by taking out the root cause of that process, which is delusion, you know, the first link in that chain. Because as long as delusion is there, all of our um, interpretations of the world, interpretations of reality are going to be bent. This is why I prefer the word delusion to ignorance, because it's something that distorts things. It's not necessarily a lack of knowledge about things or not understanding things, but it's like actually seeing them in a way that they're not. So being deluded about things like dukkha, anicca, and anatta, and seeing a self where there is no self, seeing permanence, reliability, stability, where there's actually no stability. Yeah? And as Ajahn Brahmali said, taking things that are happiness to be suffering and vice versa. Yeah, this is the change that happens when we become an Arya. We actually realize what true happiness is, and it's a different direction. It's away from the sense world, and it's a happiness that comes from within, a happiness that comes from actually stilling the senses and finding deep peace within, within ourself inside. So this beautiful uh, story about Angulimala just shows the Buddha's powers, but there are also a lot of stories that just show his humanity because he, like us, was a human being, as I said before. And there's this one really nice story, and I forget where it is. I, I tried to ask, actually, I am Ananda Bodhi earlier today, and she also couldn't remember, but she knew the story very well. And it's a story of, again, being on arms round, being wandering itinerant monks in you know, ancient India. So they would maybe stay in monasteries at some point in the Buddha's dispensation. They started to establish monasteries for the rains retreats so that they could stay inside secluded from the, the rain. And also they wouldn't be harming any living creatures by going out on the, on the muddy roads. So they'd stay in retreat and after that they would wander. And uh, there's this story that a monk wanders up to um, a farmer's house and he asks the people there have you got any place for me to stay tonight and the owner of this place says oh we do have a little um shed outside it's like the cow shed so there's some straw in there and i'm not sure if the cows were there or not but basically there was this bed of straw for this monk to sleep on and so he went there and he was very grateful and sort of set himself up and sat down to meditate intending to meditate for the night and then this other monk turned up as well. And this is the beauty, right, of Kalyanamitta. There's lots of monks in those days, so they'd actually meet each other on the way. Um, and so this other monk turned up and he basically asked the same. He said, oh, is there any place here for me tonight? I just need a simple place to stay. And uh, the owner of the place said, oh, yeah, there is somewhere to stay, but there's another monk there. Maybe you should ask him, you know, if he's okay with that. And if he's okay with that, you're welcome to stay. So this uh, second monk went in and he sort of said, is it okay if I stay here, you know, venerable sir? And the other monk said, certainly, of course. And um, the two of them meditated for the whole night, just sitting there in meditation. And in the morning, this, um, I think it was the second monk said to the first monk, oh, your meditation's pretty good. <laughs> Who is your teacher? And this monk said, oh, my teacher is the, um, fully enlightened one, the Sama Sambuddha, Arahat, Sama Sambuddha, and all these qualities of the Buddha, right? Um, this is my teacher, the blessed one, the fully enlightened one, the perfectly pure, perfect in wisdom and uh, conduct. This is my teacher, and I'm going to find him, you know, I'm on a journey to go and meet him. And the other monk said to him, Oh, would you know him if you met him? You know, would you know him? And the other monk said, He suddenly kind of got it. Oh my goodness, this is the Buddha. <laughs> and the second monk was actually the Buddha who was spending the night there. And he hadn't realized because the Buddha just looked like him. There were no defining features. You know, sometimes you read all these kind of really um, hyped up descriptions of the Buddha with the really long ears. Maybe he had some you know, earrings when he was a prince that pulled his ears down, who knows? I mean, there's all these marks of the great man. I think it's 32 marks or something of a great man. Some are a little bit exaggerated possibly, and they look 
from scholars like Adrian Mamali who've looked into the Chinese parallels. They maybe look like, you know, a little bit superfluous, maybe a few embellishments added later. But um, in stories like this, we have this really clear sense that the Buddha actually was doubtlessly very noble looking, very beautiful to look at, very serene and collected and, you know, sort of commanding of respect in that way by his comportment or is that right? Deportment. Um, but he looked pretty much like any other monk. And also just the humility of a Buddha that he was still asked this obviously junior monk, is it okay if I stay here? It wasn't like, hey, I'm the Buddha, give me the best spot, you know? <laughs> he didn't do that. He was so humble and, you know, didn't really let on until the end, I think, that he was actually the Buddha. If I do, I mean, I don't really remember the details, but I think the other monk at some point asks who his teacher is and then the Buddha says, you know, I don't have a teacher and he kind of clicks, you know, that, oh my goodness, this must be <laughs> my teacher. And of course he pays respect, he's overcome with devotion and gratitude and, and just, oh, imagine that, to realise that you've been meditating all night long with the Buddha. Can you imagine how inspired <laughs> you would feel? Wow. <laughs> So yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the qualities that um, that are discussed in the suttas about the Buddha. Just um, it's actually in the same sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya number seven and many other places. And uh, just talk a tiny bit about what they mean. So the first thing is itipiso bagawa. Here's a bagawa. It means a blessed one, the blessed one. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I was speaking to Ayananda Bodhi today and we're saying, what does it mean? You know, what does this blessed sort of um, quality really mean? And she was sort of saying, well, it's probably something that was really well understood in ancient India. You know, the word Bhagawa was probably in common usage and it, it sort of signifies something quite noble, something lofty, some sort of um, presence or aura around that person that just, you know, seems worthy of respect you know, the blessed one, something about his very presence is a blessing, you know, just to imagine a Buddha, just to see sometimes some of the statues, even though we're not taking refuge in the physical person of a Buddha, sometimes they can depict some of those qualities of serenity and, and peace and this very, very gentle smile, you know, my favorite Buddha statue is the one in Sana, in the museum there, which happens to be Ajahn Brahm's favorite, and I'm not just doing copycat, but uh, when I met that statue, so to speak, I just, I knew that it was going to be beautiful, but my eyes just filled with tears. It was just something that they captured there that was so serene. It really felt as though the person who carved that statue knew some of those qualities of a Buddha. You know, they, res they, they captured it. They were resonating somehow with that. And then the second quality is arahat. And this is really the, the main thing, you know, that the Buddha is an arahat. He's a fully enlightened person. And the word arahat literally means something like one who has killed their enemies, killed their enemies. So obviously he didn't kill his enemies in the way that Angulimala did, but he actually uprooted greed, hatred, and delusion. Finally, once and for all, completely at the root level, yeah. From his heart and in the suttas it says he made them like a palm stump <laughs> you know you can just imagine that cutting down a tree so close to the ground that it's impossible for it to grow again this is what he did you know he actually um totally uprooted those defilements and also that awakening that you know being an arahat means that you do as i said see the four noble truths and you have that insight into dependent origination this is actually something that happens with stream entry. You know, one who sees the Dhamma sees Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination. One who sees Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination, sees the Dhamma. Because it's the causality that we're seeing that Ajahn Brahmali very um, clearly mentioned is, um, is the way we start to see through non-self. It's the fact that everything is actually conditioned. It's a process. There's nothing sustaining there. There's nothing, there's no essence of a being involved. It's just cause, effect, effect, cause, cause, effect, effect, cause. Every effect becomes the cause for something else. And the whole cycle just continues. 
But a Buddha has completely uprooted that. He's basically killed rebirth, you could say, right? There's no more coming to any state of existence. Done is what had to be done. I love this so much. It says this again and again at the end of many suttas. Done is what had to be done. Just imagining that you've done everything that you came into this world or into this life for eons again and again and again and again and again. And you've done it. You know, you've done the job. You've made an end to suffering. Right? You've made a total end to suffering. And of course, we have to have some confidence that that end of suffering is bliss. It is, you know, paramamsukam, the highest happiness of Nibbana. Yeah. It's bliss to end suffering. And we start to see this as we walk the path, especially inspired by qualities and recollections, you know, like metta, loving kindness, like reflections on the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, or whatever works for you. We're also going to do some reflections on our own goodness, our own virtue as well in these evening sessions, because it's so important to start to tune into the happiness of coming out, even a tiny bit, even just surfacing for a moment from suffering and starting to experience some peace that is actually coming from the right place. It's coming from a purifying heart. It's not coming from exciting the senses. It's coming from your own inner goodness and virtue, step by step by step. And so this uh, next quality, I'll have to go quite quickly now because <laughs> I want to give lots of time for questions as well. But um, the next quality is the Samasam Buddha. And again, that means fully self-awakened one. So somebody who discovered that path himself. And we've already talked about that, the qualities that were developed over so long and that actually were able to discover the Dhamma when it wasn't, um, it was no longer being taught in the world. Mm. Pacheka Buddhas are also fully enlightened but they are not able to teach the path. It's almost as though they arrive at that city, that lost city, without really knowing quite how they found it. Whereas a Buddha knows the Eightfold Path and is able to teach it. The Pacheka Buddhas, of course, have also walked the Eightfold Noble Path, but they're not able to really explain and to teach and to convey that Dhamma to others. And that leads into some of his other qualities. So one of them, again, is Vicha um, Charana Sampano, which means um, perfect in knowledge or in wisdom and also in virtue. And I just like to think of this as having complete integrity, you know, that somebody's values are completely aligned with their body, speech and mind. Um, they walk the talk, if you like, right? <laughs> and that's often something that's very kindly said about Ajahn Brahm as well. Like he walks his talk. He's not just speaking about, you know, deep meditation and how it feels to have a purified heart. He's actually experiencing these things. And you can feel the difference when this happens, you know. It's something very inspiring and gives you so much confidence that, oh, my goodness, this may be possible for me. So Vicha Charana Sampano. And then uh, sugato means literally kind of well gone. And I tend to think of that, sometimes it's translated as sublime, but that doesn't mean too much to me. It's more like, to me, sugato means they've really gone through all the rounds of existence and they've gone beyond. I don't know if that's the literal meaning, but it's probably not worth worrying too much about these words. And the next one is lokavidu, which literally means he's a knower of the worlds. So again, that he's gone to all these realms, different realms, you know, realms of the devas, realms of the jhanas, realms beyond the jhanas, the formless realms, and also knows all of that and knows something beyond that too. Yeah. And he's also the teacher of, uh, incomparable teacher of those to be trained or those who are tameable incomparable teacher so again you know he's actually able to convey the dhamma in a way that really works for other people and as such i always find sarnath in the indian uh, holy site sarnath for me is one of the most if not the most powerful <laughs> because even though the buddha was enlightened in Bodhgaya, and most people think of that as the most holy place ajahn brahm thinks of um Krishinagar as the most holy place because that's where he actually entered parinibbana I tend to think of Sarnath as, I mean, they're all holy, but that's my favorite because that's where the Buddha found out that yes, this can be taught. 
You know, he wasn't so sure about that in the beginning. He was like, are there even people who will understand this? And how do we know that such a thing can be conveyed? Is it not something that you just, you're either lucky to discover or, or not? But in Sarnath, it be, you know, he gave this teaching, the um, Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta about the middle path and the Four Noble Truths. And the first stream enterers were born. The first stream enterer, one of them, one of the five monks became a stream enterer. He also saw dependent origination, how everything that arises, arises due to causes. And when those causes cease, everything disappears. Mind and matter, body and mind. Mm -hmm. The whole thing disappears when there's no more causes to keep them going. So for me, that's really incredible. And in that sense, he was, you know, an incomparable teacher and the Kalyanamitta Supreme, if you want, the real spiritual friend to all of us, because we're only getting that now because of his teaching. If he hadn't taught it, I don't know where I'd be in my life. I don't know about any of you, but um, I don't know. Our lives may be a little less hopeful, <laughs> a little less meaningful, and we'd be missing out on a lot of potential happiness that we're just starting to taste, but we only really have a little taste of so far. And then also he was known as um, Sata Deva Manusanam. Buddha Bhagawa, and it basically means the teacher of gods and humans, as well as people, right? So gods and humans, he also taught. And uh, it's really interesting in the suttas because sometimes he completely confounded some of these higher beings in different realms because they think that they're gods, you know, especially people like Mara. Mara is like a sort of deity who's in control of other beings' creations and uh, manifests in our mind as a lot of disturbance in our meditation. And the main reason for that is because Mara actually wants to keep us in the world, you know, whether in the Deva world or the human realm, or, but he wants to keep us in these lokas, karma loka. And uh, he gets very confused when people go into jhanas yeah, or people get into liberation, enlightenment, because he can't find them. He can't go to those places. So then it's like, oh, where's this recluse gone? He's disappeared and he gets very upset about it. So Mara is the one that tries to stop us getting into those realms. You'll find it coming up in your meditation, you know, however far or close you think you are, there'll be just something that sort of knocks you off course. And often that's this uh, sense of Mara, which is a personification of the control freak in chief, we could say. <laughs> So the Buddha actually taught the devas, he taught the gods, the devas would come down and listen to the Buddha teaching, you know, with folded hands and sometimes they would light up the whole um, grove, like in the Mangala Sutta, it starts by saying, you know, these radiant devas came down and illuminated all of Jetavana grove. And so they would come because they wanted to hear the Dhamma from the Buddha as well. So a very powerful being and yet also a very human very relatable being who had his own struggles as well. He wasn't liked by everyone. People tried to kill him. His own cousin tried to kill him. So he had his struggles, but he had this great serenity, this great wisdom and peace. Fully equanimous, full equanimity, the kind of equanimity that dwells compassionately, but also knows that, you know, all this is just the play of the world but teaches where they can that runs on these Brahma Viharas of loving kindness and compassion, sympathetic joy, and basically spends their entire life just serving, just teaching the Dhamma without any judgment, without any measurement, teaching the Dhamma to all kinds of people, people like us, people who were kings, people who were prostitutes, people who were mass murderers, you know, anyone who came to the Dhamma, we would give that Dhamma to. So I hope that we can take some of these qualities, some of these, um, this inspiration perhaps, something in there that can inspire and uplift and encourage into our meditation. So let's do some meditation together for about half an hour, 25 minutes or so.
and taking your time to really choose a comfortable posture and to settle however long it takes <laughs> Respecting your body's needs, especially at the end of the day like this. And practicing all day. Sometimes in retreats, as the time goes by, people's cushion mountains get higher. Just noticing the physical posture of sitting, the strength in that posture, the power, the resolve, just sitting quietly. With confidence to meet your inner world. sitting the way the Buddha sat. Maybe not in the same posture, doesn't matter, but just sitting to go inside, to turn away from this five selves realm, all the various input, And to see where all this is coming from. Just settling, quietening into the body. away from the intellectual world and into the feeling world. And if you wish, I'd like to offer an invitation to do some reflection on the Buddha by just imagining how it would be to be in the presence of a Buddha, a fully awakened, infinitely compassionate, gentle, wise, humble being. Imagining the depth of peace you can pick up from such a being. Someone who's done what needed to be done. Who's laid down, uprooted, all craving all aversion, all delusion, 
and just abides compassionately, concerned only with the welfare of all living beings, gazing upon you now with kindly, compassionate eyes. How does it feel to be in the presence of a Buddha? What are the qualities of a Buddha that touch you, that nourish you most deeply? Can you feel those qualities within yourself as you tune up to this idea of a Buddha? or sense the possibility for these qualities to start growing within you. Just by bringing them to mind. Perhaps you feel a stirring of devotion, of love, of respect in your heart. Not toward the person of a Buddha, but the qualities they embody and they exude. devotion to those qualities and cultivating those qualities within yourself. A love for the beautiful, for the good.
just allowing yourself to open to any pleasure, any joy connected to that. Not trying to fabricate or create a certain feeling, but just remaining open, sensitive to any uplift, any energizing qualities of this devotion, this confidence might arise in your heart. And if the breath arises or any other object of your meditation comes to mind, see if you can meet that too with the qualities of a Buddha, compassion, devotion. Even with reverence, just this single breath or this single thought of loving kindness or whatever you feel in the body, in your emotional world, holding everything with the great compassion, the equanimity, the expansive heart of a Buddha. not needing to be anywhere else. Contented, like a Buddha who has already done what had to be done. And all you need to do is just be here.
And as we come close to the end of the meditation, once again, remembering, imagining that the Buddha is sitting right here with you. Alive for you. Buddha who, who lived 2,600 years ago, who taught for you, for the sake of future generations of men and women, transgender people, non-binary people, people from every race, who established the bhikkhu and the bhikkhuni sangha and swore not to pass away until there were enlightened nuns, monks, lay men and lay women in the world, knowing that we would need to hear this Dhamma knowing there would be beings with little dust in their eyes, capable of understanding the Dhamma. That's why the Buddha taught for us. If you wish, you might feel moved to express your respect to the Buddha in whatever way feels appropriate to you, in your mind, in your heart, or just paying respect to those same qualities, the qualities of kindness, of wisdom, serenity and peace that you nurture and develop in your heart. <laughs> Someone's knocking on my, uh, the neighbor is knocking on my door. Feels like they're saying, come on, <laughs> come out of the meditation. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Good. So please, uh, any questions? Please write them in to Q&A Leone today. And I will do my best to speak to those questions. And if anything is confusing or doesn't work or, you know, is not work going well for you, please don't be shy. Sometimes we think everyone's getting it, everyone's doing well, and <laughs> we're all... Um, we're all just trying our best, that's it. We're just practicing, making mistakes, falling over, getting up again. <laughs> so, I can see there's a question about um, Anukampa, the project. I'll come to that a little bit later. <laughs> I talk a lot about that all the time, actually. <laughs> Oh, interesting questions here. <clears throat> so how does Ven Chanda dis define a stream winner? <laughs> I think I should probably say how the Buddha dis defines a stream winner. Um, but uh, I'll give my understanding of a stream winner. Um, to be a stream winner, you really need to see dependent origination. <laughs> That's what makes one a stream winner. In the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, the first stream winner after the Buddha, of course, who must have gone through those stages very quickly on the day of his enlightenment, the night of his enlightenment, he um, basically says, Sabbam tam nirodha dhammanti. Oh, I forget the whole Pali phrase but it's basically of all the things that have the nature to uh, to arise all those things have the nature to pass away everything that has the nature to arise has the nature to pass away in other words everything <laughs> so that is my understanding of stream winning like as long as someone still thinks that there's something in here that's permanent something that can continue after death some kind of little piece of refined consciousness, I don't know what they call this kind of consciousness, unconditioned consciousness, sometimes you hear unconditioned awareness or amar uh, what do they call it? Uh, something like Amarachita or something, the deathless mind. Anyway, nothing like this is said anywhere in the suttas. Amatachitta, that's it. Yeah, this is not there in the suttas. In the suttas, chitta, manno, vinyana are all spoken about as synonyms. And so everything that arises passes away. Um, earlier today, Ajahn Brahmali spoke about Nama Rupa, which you can translate as name and form or mind and matter or mind and mental content, some, some people translate it as. And uh, also the chitta. And there's one passage in uh, the Samyutta Nikaya, I think it's in the Nidana Samyutta, and it basically says that, um, yeah, consciousness and name and form or mind and matter, they're like two sheaths of reeds. So if you remove one, the other falls down. If you remove Nama Rupa, there's no consciousness. If you have no consciousness, you have no Nama Rupa. Consciousness has to have an object. So to say there's some kind of consciousness that's just there without an object is actually delusion. And I'll get into trouble by some, uh, views that are quite popular in Buddhism for saying that, but I, I have very deep confidence in my understanding of the suttas and, and in my teachers who've, um, you know, explained this. Also in Myanmar, I mean, and, and Sri Lanka, as far as I know, I, uh, everyone understands this, you know, that the mind is conditioned too, and that is what makes the difference between Buddhism and any other religion, as Ajahn Brahmali said. So I think this is really important, you know, to see that chain of causality and to realize, my goodness, what I thought was a self, what I thought was, you know, someone in here in control of this or something in here that's going to last, that is just a delusion, it's just a process. It's not I feel, it's feeling feels. It's not I perceive or I think, it's thinking thinks, perception perceives. It's not that there's something behind that that we can say is a, a me, an I, an entity. It's just there's a process that's happening, that's caused, that's conditioned, and that keeps on going on. 
There are other aspects to a stream winner, like the consequence of stream winning, for example. So the consequence of stream winning is that one has right view. And we can call that the right view of a stream winner, the right view that is noble. So there's right view, which is preliminary that we have initially, you know, that we can hold almost like as a hypothesis. We have some insight into the fact that there is some kind of conditionality, yeah, that our actions of body, speech and mind do have effects for the positive or the negative. Um, that there is such a thing as rebirth. It's actually there, even in preliminary right view, that there are beings who are born spontaneously, that there is this and the other world. These are aspects of right view. So at least you don't have to believe it, but at least to have hold it as a possibility, stay open to that possibility. And that there is mother, father, there are ascetics and Brahmins. And this all, again, refers to the fact that, you know, there's something to be grateful for. We're not just born of our own free will. Like we're born based on our parents and we have this sort of sense of gratitude to them. They're also a field for us to make merit, for us to make good karma. And the same with the ascetics and Brahmins. There are people who have gone forth. There are people who have realized things we have yet to realize. There is such a thing as enlightenment. There is something to attain. These are all aspects of preliminary right view. But when that view becomes a noble is when somebody has walked the whole Eightfold Path and uh, seen into the nature of this mind and matter, you know, seen things like non-self. So this is what happens to a stream winner. And then when they start to walk the path, they continue walking the path, but they walk it with right view, like really, really strong right view that can never be overturned. So they can never again believe in a self. Although their thoughts and perceptions might still sometimes think in those ways, it's actually the view is perfected. That's how I understand stream winning. And of course they live a very virtuous life. A very virtuous life but it's not that they're absolutely incapable of breaking sila for example they might say a white lie or something but it's very minor and it's very unlikely also um, but a stream winner has yet to overcome um, craving and aversion that only happens at the third stage of enlightenment the second stage of enlightenment the um once returner yeah once returner has weakened those two so there's a bit of a like a not a very clear distinction between the first and the second stage. It's sometimes hard to know because as far as I understand from teachers I trust that I've talked to, it's not a very obvious experience, the second stage, whereas stream winning is an experience. It's like something goes boom in the mind, like something stops. That's my understanding. Something kind of falls away. You go out of this realm of mind and matter for a moment or you see that that's possible. I'm speaking now from what I understand, not from my direct experience, just to be clear. So, but for the second stage, it's a little bit. When for people that I've met that I have confidence in as stream winners, I'm thinking of my teacher in Burma here. I have seen him um, become angry about something that anyone would have become exasperated about, I think. Um, but still, it was a shock to me because until then I just saw him exude metta and equanimity and tranquility. But what I noticed is it came and it just went, you know, there was nothing lingering and there was no kind of even explanation or kind of beating himself up. There was nothing like that. So I think for a stream winner, there's like, for me being around people like this, there's something very remarkably different because they don't see or view or treat you in terms of a self. There's this sense that you're this being for conventional purposes. There's this being here who suffers in this way and in that way due to causes and they just have compassion. They don't judge, they don't measure. And they know that if you're on this path, you're going to be going in the right direction. They have confidence actually in you, which is really amazing. It's incredibly inspiring to be around that because we measure ourselves in terms of a self and they don't do that. So something very, very different about being around them. And it takes a while to realize it, but you know, you see them over years and years and it's like, wow, they've never judged me. They've never fixed me. They just never give up on me. <laughs> They're just there to serve. They just relate to you with compassion. You know, they're not perfect also, right? They might be annoying and tell stupid jokes or whatever, but 
<laughs> that's my own interpretation for them it's just joy it's just lightness you know and there's just nothing behind it it's just pure heartedness it's beautiful <laughs> okay in relation to compassion for all sentient beings, are there references in the suttas to vegan or vegetarian diet and also in terms of alms offerings? There are not any direct references to vegan or vegetarian diet. The only real thing the Buddha says that I know about where he speaks of meat is that alms mendicants should never take meat that's been killed or animals that have been killed for them. So if they know that somebody's killed an animal for you and therefore you've been directly the cause of somebody's death or an animal's death then you shouldn't accept that food but if there's no knowledge of that if it hasn't been killed just for you then you are allowed to accept that food having said that of course in the times of ancient india um i think the ecosystems were probably much more holistic and still intact there was no such thing as factory farming or, you know, any of these um, horrible kind of feeding of, I don't know what they feed to animals and livestock these days, antibiotics, all kinds of horrible things. Um, you know, the, I suppose the demand did not outweigh, is that right? Outweigh supply like it does now. It's not like animals were forced into tiny conditions and killed in horrible ways. So there is a difference, I think, and yet for arms mendicants, we are supposed to receive whatever's offered. So that was the way the Buddha taught in his time. However, in Burma, my teacher made it clear that ours was a vegetarian monastery and it was that simple. We just didn't receive any meat because once people knew it was quite easy for them to just offer vegetables. In my own personal path, I've been vegetarian, was vegetarian from the age of about 19 and pretty much vegan, mainly because I just didn't like the idea of dairy and I didn't, didn't seem to suit me either. Um, and in Burma, it was completely vegan. Uh, milk was a total luxury. I remember the first time I saw milk in Yangon after about three years, I was like, oh my goodness, this is weird. And it tasted really weird as well. And uh, yeah, I actually didn't digest it. Um, having said that, since then I became quite ill and one of the only ways I could get out of it, the only thing actually after many uh, months of not being able to actually keep food inside, I remember having a piece of chicken and it actually stayed inside and I thought, oh, okay, because it was neutral, it was kind of alkaline-ish compared to anything else. Um, and so it seemed to settle my tummy. And even until now, I still rely on a little bit of meat and fish. So my attitude has changed from being kind of quite militant vegetarian and quite judgmental of everyone else to realizing that sometimes there really is a physical need, which I would not have believed before I got sick. So I think sometimes that's quite humbling. I honestly wouldn't have believed it. And I have tried since to become vegan and after watching Cowspiracy, this horrible documentary, well, it's important. I tried again, that was in California a few years ago and I was just sick. I remember the next day having an egg and I felt immediately better. So my attitude is that we should reduce and minimize harm as much as we can um, and not be too judgmental about others. But honestly, ask yourself what you can do to live as harmless a life as you can. And I think for lay people who have much more choice about their diet, it can be possible uh, to live a, a vegetarian or a vegan lifestyle. Um, it can be possible, but it's also a privilege. I mean, sometimes people say veganism is not more expensive than a meat diet, but I'm, I'm not sure. I think it also involves being a bit educated because I studied Ayurveda for many years. And you know, one of our questions was like how to bring these principles of Indian medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, which are largely lifestyle based to kind of um, more um, de deprived communities. Is that the right word? Um, economically less affluent communities. And the idea of talking about lentils and this kind of tofu and this and this, it was just not gonna work you know, for working class families in England who rely on frozen pizza and chips. It's just, it's difficult. So try to be careful about judging and being unconscious of your privilege around making choices. If you've got that privilege, make good choices, but please try not to judge others. That's the most important thing. 
And I think, you know, it had helped the vegan cause a lot. If rather than saying everyone should be vegan, we put out the message, everyone can try and reduce because that's something people feel they can achieve. And when it seems too hard to achieve, that's actually been proven by psychologists to be quite a disincentive to make changes because you just think, well, I never can do it. So I might as well not even try because I'm going to fail, you know? So, so that's quite a long answer, but I think in monasteries, it's actually quite helpful sometimes to have a variety of things that people can choose from. But um, I'm hoping that as I get better, I might be able to go back to a vegetarian diet. I don't know. So there you go. That's my honest response. Will Mara ever die? That's really interesting. <laughs> I think the way I've understood it from Ajahn Brahm is that it's kind of like a station in samsara. So it might not always be the same one there, the same being, but it's like a post that someone can be born into. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there's only one of them, one Mara. You only ever really hear about one Mara. And I think it's a male. It always says he slinks away. So he slinks away when you say, Mara, I know you. There's all these lovely stories in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta about Mara approaching these Bhikkhunis in the forest who are meditating. And, um, and then they say things like, oh, you are just a woman with your two-fingered wisdom. What hope have you got for enlightenment? You know, Two-fingered, I suppose it means instead of a full hand or something, like you're quite incompetent, you know, you're not as well equipped. Uh, so, and then this enlightened Bhikkhuni Soma, she says, what does gender matter at all when the mind is completely pure to one who thinks I am a woman or I am, a, I am a man or I am anything at all is fit for Mara to address. And then it says Mara sort of, sort of uh, dejected and, and dismayed sort of with hunched shoulders slinks away. Ooh, the nun knows me, the nun knows me. <laughs> so they walk away. So Mara is actually, yeah, they're a control freak, but once you can kind of get free from their control, they feel a bit depressed because they want you to keep you in their kind of terrain. Mm. They don't want you disappearing where they can't control you, right? In the jhanas. They say that when you get into the jhanas, that's the first time that Mara is blindfolded. They can't find you anymore. <laughs> don't worry, no one here is gonna be reborn as Mara, hopefully. Oh my goodness, there's loads of questions and I'm, how has the time gone so fast? My goodness. Okay. Do the Brahma Viharas work only in sequence or do they stand alone? I.e., does Upeka arise out of Metta Karuna Mudita or does it arise independently? That's a great question. I think both. I think it sort of depends as well on how you're practicing them. Like if you're practicing them in a Samadhi way, um, my experience is more that they arise from each other, but that could be just due to what happened naturally. It might not be that that always is the case, but it wouldn't surprise me if it is because they are related to the four jhanas and the four jhanas have to be done in sequence. So I think it's good to start with metta because this establishes you in a very pure kind of love it's like a very foundational Brahma Vihara if you like that can be used everywhere in every situation whereas the others are a bit more like takes on that Upeka of course is also very encompassing but Karuna is more specifically directed to those who are suffering and Mudita is more directed to those who are happy and it's harder they say it's harder because our tendency is to feel jealous of people who are you know happy and successful and experiencing a lot of um joy in their life. So I would say start with the metta um, if you're practicing as a Brahma Vihara, but all of them can be used at different times to as antidotes to various things that arise. So I did a retreat, a day retreat on Mudita where we specifically focused on joy, developing joy, seeing the goodness in the world and goodness in ourselves. Um, and yeah, overcoming a little bit of envy. So and resentment also. And the same with Karuna, you can use it independently as well. Um, I think Upeka without any of the others could be a little cool. I just think you have to develop Metta, Karuna and Mudita 
especially metta on this path because there's a danger otherwise that a pekka is going to fall into some kind of cool aloof indifference to the suffering in the world i think it's better to learn to relate to the suffering in the world with kindness and compassion in a way that opens the heart before we move into being cool and aloof it's similar to the way that we need to meet suffering we need to understand suffering before we can transcend it if we just try to transcend it before we really have a look at it i think we miss out on a, a lot of potential to develop wisdom and i know for myself just the last few days i've been having some things coming up you know things like doubts about all sorts of things and you know this happens on the path to everybody and Yesterday in particular, I was really suffering actually before I came for the evening talk. And then it just blows my mind sometimes that that almost instantly gives rise to more love because I just felt like the metta was coming out. You know, I really felt like full of metta and it was in direct relationship to having contacted quite a deep suffering in my heart. I don't know, I find this path really amazing in that way because it seems to make sense of the suffering and it puts it to good use for others. I'm probably going a bit off track with the answer, but uh, <laughs> all of them can be used as attitudes to your meditation. And in that way, they can be used at any time. Like I was saying, I used to practice a lot of upeka with uh, the arising and passing of sensations. And that's a great one to use to weaken craving and aversion at the link of sensation of Vedana, independent origination, because it does very much reduce craving and aversion in response to Vedana. And likewise, the others as attitudes, as ways of relating can be used at any time. I hope that's not confusing. Please ask again if I made that really confusing. <laughs> um, okay. I guess basically it's like practice should be quite spontaneous. Don't worry too much. Just make sure you do a bit of everything. I've been meditating for some years now in different traditions, mostly secular ones, but I only recently decided to fully commit to the Buddhist path. I feel overwhelmed by all the teachings, practices and qualities to develop and don't know where to start. Any suggestion? So my first suggestion is not even to try to follow all the teachings and practices that are being offered because um, it's impossible and you don't need them, basically. I would say just start with whatever resonates for you. If some of these practices seem good to you, for example, the way Ajahn Brahmali just gently kind of encourages you to relax and to develop a good feeling about yourself and then just to be quiet. If that works, go for that. If the body scan helps relax you and helps you to develop mindfulness, go for that, you know. Um, keep it simple. The most important thing is not which practice you do. It's just relating to yourself, first of all yourself whether it's your body your mind your emotions your thoughts learning to relate to that with kindness that's really the whole crux of this path because that's where the transformation is mm -hmm. most of the time we relate to it with craving if we want to change it or if we like it we want more of it or with aversion if uh, if we want to get rid of it or if the emotions are overwhelming we just don't want to feel them you know we try and numb out we try and get away from it so instead, opening the heart with kindness to just contact these things. And the practices really are just about different ways to help you do that, I would say. This teaching, this particular retreat is very, very full of teachings because that's the particular style of Ajahn Brahmali. And I guess I'm giving different reflections in the evenings because I know that many of you have practiced a lot before and it might be nice to have a bit of variety, but um, yeah. Please just keep it simple. I hope that helps. You don't have to follow everything at all. Okay, I'll try and... So someone's asking how to share merit after a meditation. Would there be any merit to share if the meditation wasn't so good? Thank you. There'd be so much merit to share because you can't say whether it was good or not. The fact is that you meditated and that is good. So you've got loads of merit to share because you've just dedicated your time to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. You've just given an offering to the Dhamma, to the Buddha. Mm -hmm. So this is a really beautiful thing. So 
The best way I know of sharing merit is to send metta, just to send metta. You, if you want to link it more specifically, you can say, you know, may whatever happiness, whatever peace I've developed in this meditation, or just may my intention to practice, my, the goodness of my intention to practice, may this go to alleviate the suffering of all beings, or may this help alleviate the suffering of this particular being or that particular being. But I would also just advise everyone really at some point in the day or maybe even at the end of every practice to just spread metta, you know, may I be happy, may I be peaceful, may you be happy, may you be peaceful, whatever words work for you. And that is sharing some of the peace and kindness in your heart. Even just that intention is already sharing merit, so it's a very beautiful intention. Mm -hmm. Okay, so someone's, I'm just gonna do it really quickly. I'm sorry that this won't be very satisfactory, but I want to do as many as I can. Um, to what extent can monastics talk about special or magic experiences and powers? Uh, our hats would have no need to make those claims. In other cases, could explanations of experiences help to boost a follower's faith based on wisdom? Yes, and definitely monastics do explain uh, meditation experiences. And uh, the thing is, you won't really know for sure whether they're explaining it from experience or from their knowledge. Sometimes it's maybe a bit of a mixture. Like sometimes you've got some of the experience, not the full experience, and you can explain it to a point and you can infer the next few steps. Um, sometimes you just kind of can tell with somebody that they've experienced these things and it can be very inspiring. But as I say, don't take that as a given because you have to really watch that person and say, okay, so if that's true, how does it affect them? How does it affect their life? How does it affect the way they treat people? And then only you can really know. Yeah. Sometimes monastics are allowed to tell each other. Well, we are actually, but we don't very much but sometimes we do, depending on how close and how much trust there is, just like with ordinary life, isn't it? Like you, you share more with some friends than you do with others, right? And that can be really inspiring. And then actually one time Ajahn Brahm put me on the spot because somebody came to his retreat and they said, Ajahn Brahm, my friend, <laughs> my friend wants to know, he asked me to ask you if you are enlightened and you know, experience all the jhanas. <laughs> So Ajahn Van said, oh, I can't say anything about that because that would be, you know, breaking my rule. But Venerable Chanda, she's allowed to say because <laughs> she's allowed to say on my behalf, you know. So then he put me on the spot. So I just said, well, I feel Ajahn Van's teaching is from experience. That's my, my confidence anyway. <laughs> so that was like, oh. So I think the main thing is that... Um, we don't talk in terms of I have this or I have attained that or I am a such and such because that's just self view, you know, which is why I said that I think what Ajahn Brahm teaches comes from experience. That's quite different from saying he's a this or he's a that because I honestly can't say for sure any, any of that. I can't know 100%, right? I mean, even if someone tells you, you can't know 100%. So... But what he always says is if a, if a monastic does make a claim, it's a sure sign they're not enlightened because they just don't have that sort of way of looking at things or, or way of defining themselves. It would be considered a kind of a conceit, almost a wrong view. So, but you can, you can infer. And uh, certainly people can discuss and describe the meditation experiences in a way that is very, very inspiring and definitely boosts a follower's faith. So if you ever ask Ajahn Brahm, you know, to tell you what it's like to experience deep meditation, he'll probably tell you. And you might think he's just speaking from the text or you might see something in his eyes that's shining and you might think, hmm. <laughs> oh gosh, gosh, there's so many questions. Okay, so about the Buddha visiting other planes of existence. Am I? Oh, questions are changing there. I'm trying to kind of get a few different types of questions. Uh, and projected himself to different places. Do I know or can I tell whether these are, 
are not exaggerations. I don't think they are. I don't know. I don't know, but I think it's possible because my teacher in Burma, he also had psychic powers in some ways. He had divine ear and divine eye and everybody knew that. And it was very obvious <laughs> because he'd talk about what I'd been talking about with my friend in English and he didn't speak English. And he'd talk about exactly like number one, number two, number three, he'd make three points, which were the three points I spoke about with my friend that day. And then he'd make those three points and give the answers in the evening, you know? And this would happen all the time. Like he'd say things about monks, you think this and this and this, you think that I'm doing it because of this and this and this, that's not true. Sayadaw's doing it because of this and this and this. And the monks would be like, oh, how come he heard what we were talking about? You know, they were like quite freaked out. But, uh, and he'd talk a lot about devas and different kinds of beings that he would see, like strange beings, like half man, half bird type beings and different types of devas. and. Um, yeah, there was actually a nun there at one point and she was getting into some really deep meditation and starting to hear sounds that were a long way away as though they were really close and things like this. So it's just that the perception starts to change, I think. So I don't know about walking long distances, visiting other planes. I think, yeah, it's definitely possible because, I mean, from what I understood about my teacher, it was more that those planes are visible to you. It's not that you go somewhere, it's more that you might be able to see beings that other people can't see with their ordinary sense apparatus. Yeah. So I think it's just when the mind gets very strong, but it's not necessary and it's not something to dwell on and it can actually be a bit of a um, distraction if you get too kind of fascinated with that. And sometimes when my teacher spoke a lot about it, I think, oh my goodness, he hangs around more with the devas than he does with people like me. <laughs> I think, oh, you see, I'm suffering. <laughs> sometimes, not always, but sometimes it was very inspiring, especially when I knew he could, he knew what was happening in my mind. That was extremely powerful because then of course the teaching instructions are quite precise. So yeah, I'm lucky that I've lived in those um, cultures where these things are very much alive and quite normalized really among countries where there are lots and lots of people practicing very deeply. Um, okay. Okay. So there's a question about transgender or non-binary individuals in the suttas and disciplinary rules or codes of conduct that apply to them if they were to ordain as there are to male and females. And this is a massive question that I'm not an expert about at all, but um, there is something called a pandaka and there's been a lot of discussion about what that actually means. And again, I haven't read about it in detail. There's been some new research, especially by Venerable Vimala, who's um, a Belgian Bikuni. Actually, she's Dutch. And she's written a paper about it that looks at it from the perspective of trying to open up opportunities for people that are part of the LGBTQIA community. And it seems that most more progressive monastics would certainly say that it's possible to take the novice ordination. So you can be in brown robes, you can be a monastic. Um, but there's just a few questions in the bhikkhuni and bhikkhu ordination that ask like, are you a real female or a real, a real woman or a real man? And that's the controversial bit because who defines that, <laughs> you know? Who's defining that? Where on the spectrum? <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you call it, but exactly where do you stand? I mean, what, is it enough to identify as a male or female or what exactly and who exactly defines that? So that is the big question. And as with everything, as with bhikkhuni ordination, there'll be monastics and ways of reading the Vinaya, which are more conservative and that close opportunities and there'll be ways of reading and interpreting and studying it that try to open opportunities and I think it depends on people's willingness or wish to be inclusive as to for how far they'll go with that and then there may be communities which will accept them anyway even if it is controversial but it's difficult when it's in the Vinaya it's actually quite difficult um, 
but I think there shouldn't be any, in my mind, any obstacle whatsoever to living a monastic life, as long as there are, um, uh, what do you call them, facilities, like accommodation, right, that's suitable, that everybody feels comfortable with. I hope that helps a bit. So it's, it's yeah, something that I'm not the expert on, but it shouldn't really, it should, I, I feel it has to start to be more inclusive. And somebody's saying that they didn't realize how hard it would be for nuns in the Western world, and they're sad to hear that. <laughs> I wish you the very best with your project to open a monastery for bhikkhunis. Can you please update us on the Anu Kampa bhikkhuni project, please? And this is probably something we'll go into a bit more detail with at the end, but just for now, um, the project started five and a half years ago with me. <laughs> so it's a really unusual one because we didn't have a trust that invited me. It was just me coming over to try and find people that might be interested. So it's really uh, the backwards way around in a sense of doing things. But because Adrian Brown is doing it with me and he's my, you know, kind of spiritual teacher, obviously, and also advisor on the project I sort of feel like it gives me a sense of confidence that I can do the impossible almost or at least take a bigger risk um, so it's a challenge because being alone as a nun is really an extraordinary situation to be in normally the whole point of being monastic is that you have a sangha and you have like a foundation of support so your food and your basic needs are all met so we've had to devise different systems to um, to manage that um, so it's almost like we're at the stage which would normally be pre-monastic, like this would just be the stage of gathering the lay people, establishing the trust, gathering the funds, etc. But the difference is that I'm here already, so they have to do something with me. Um, <laughs> and also because I'm here, I sort of have to teach and that helps, of course, because it helps spur things on and I can also do a lot of good Dhamma service and get good teachers to teach you all. So in that sense, it's probably faster than most, but it's also a lot more wearing on me than it would be than I think any bikini that I know has been through actually. Um, I might be wrong, but I don't know any that have done it like this. Um, so we're fairly well on in the project in the sense that we do have some funds, but to be honest, we still need about half a million pounds, which is a lot of money. And that has kind of increased because the housing prices have increased in this country a lot in recent uh, months and years. So even though we have almost, yeah, about a million, which sounds like a lot and which would buy us about three or four Aloka Viharas in the US with about 18 acres of land each, it would buy us about four of their monasteries. Over here, it doesn't really get as much more than a sort of five or six bedroom house. So yeah, so this is a thing. And also we need people to come and stay with me to, to like take care of the property, to do the admin, uh, to manage the project because I'm sort of working right in the engine of the thing. So at the moment about, I hate to say it, it's about 80 or 90% of my energy is on running the project and only 10 or 20 is what's left for teaching. And it would really need to change because that doesn't even include my own meditation time. Ideally, you'd have 10 or 20%, maybe 30 teaching and the rest would be your meditation time. <laughs> so, um, so that has to change in the long run. And normally I have, I take, I'm diligent and protective, extremely protective of my three months range retreat every year. Uh, but last year and this year, it's hard because I can't get to Perth where I'm fully supported. And I'm also supported spiritually as well as peer wise because I've got a lot of friends there from the years that I lived over there. So yeah, two years on the run to miss that is quite tough. And uh, I'm just really not even daring to think about the possibility that I can't get there next year because next year I would like to do a little bit of a longer retreat and just really resource myself because once we do get a monastery, I'm in it for good, you know, <laughs> so it's going to be, my path somehow is a very challenging one. I don't know. I don't know why that is, whether it's that I need to develop more qualities probably. Uh, but also, you know, because there aren't places for women, we actually need, if we've got any chance, I think we have to take the chance to, to try and develop more opportunities. 
And I know that I'm very committed to monastic life. I know I've got an incredible teacher, the best in the world in my mind. <laughs> At least it's a very good relationship as well. And so I feel I've got a chance, you know, but we need a lot of, we need a lot more support. We need more finances as well. Um, and then I would like to move to Stroud. I don't know why, I just want to go there. Unfortunately, everyone wants to go there now, apparently. So the highest prices have gone up. <laughs> so, but we'll see. Causes and conditions have to just come together. And it's one of those things that I can't will into being, you know, I think one of my mistakes, I was talking to Ayam Ananda Bodhi earlier, one of my mistakes sometimes is that I think it's all down to me and I have to get it together and like trying so hard to bring the causes together. And I can't because the causes are so multifaceted and varied and have to involve so many people, so many kind of serendipitous events really that are kind of out of my hands. But um, yeah, I don't want to give up easily. So I'm still hoping that it's all going to keep going in the good direction. And uh, just to acknowledge that there are people here who are very supportive of this project, if not everyone, but certainly we have some key volunteers here as well who helped me in so many amazing ways, you know, spreading the Dhamma on Facebook and on YouTube channel and hope, helping to co-host these retreats. And, uh, you know, this is what makes me feel like a sense of real commitment and, and devotion to this community, to this project, because there's real people involved. So I think it's wonderful. I believe very much in what we're doing. Um, I just have to pace it a bit so that I can stay the whole course. <laughs> so thanks for asking. I hope that's not too much about outside things in the middle of a retreat. <laughs> um, but yeah, we can talk more again as well at the end about, uh, about it. And yeah, I hope someone from Perth will come to help me. But actually, one bikuni was supposed to come, but she was only visiting. So she would have stayed about two or three months. But then the, the week, the week before... She was gonna, well, the week, yeah, what was it? She was about to book a flight and then the borders closed. <laughs> it was like within days, it was just within a few days. And she said, oh my goodness, I, I don't think it's gonna work. And then the borders closed. So but hopefully in the end that might help. And thank you. Someone says they think it's quite inspirational. That's wonderful. Good. I hope so. I think we need variety in monasticism. We need fresh, fresh opportunities, fresh voices. We need to bring in, I hope that, you know, being a bhikkhuni, it can also help to bring in more marginalized groups because we understand how it feels. At least we have more of an idea. Uh, I'm not saying I understand how it is to be black or to be, you know, gay or transgender because that's not the case, but as a woman in Theravada Buddhism, where there are very, very few resources, it's, uh, it's really tough. It's the kind of marginalization I've never experienced or never could have prepared for in uh, ordinary life. Yeah, it's tough. Thank you for asking. I feel your empathy and support is lovely. <laughs> Good, so I think we've got through everything and only a little bit late. And people are sending gratitude. Thank you so much. It really means everything. It really does. Yeah. And it's gratitude to everyone because, like I say, I can't do it. I mean, it's a whole team of people. It's a whole team, a huge team. And not only people here, you know, it's people internationally, like people in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, a few Thai supporters, actually, who do send dana donations. And you really want to see this happen. So, yeah. It will happen one day. <laughs> I'm the Tenzin Palma of Theravada. Yeah, it's a shame I didn't have 12 years in a cave. That's all I can say. Ah, then I'd feel ready. <laughs> or maybe not, right? We might never feel ready. <laughs> but yeah, she's an amazing nun. She's an amazing nun. But she practiced, I mean, she opened her monastery in India. So it's much more understood because it's a part of a Buddhist culture and community, right? She's in the Tibetan um area so it, again it's a different thing um people understand what it is over there so we're trying to 
yeah, bring the whole concept really of monastics and monasticism and renunciation to um, partially Buddhist and partially non-Buddhist communities. So it's quite a different animal. <laughs> Great. Oh, thank you so much for your lovely comments. I think I should let you go because we're late and it, you need to have your beauty sleep, right? Mental beauty sleep. <laughs> So good night and big sadhu to everybody. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And just for the sake of the live stream, it's not only me doing that, everyone's doing that. They've all been trained. <laughs> so take care and good night. See you tomorrow. <laughs>